How much I eat, I never put on weight. With one exception I've been the same weight for 10 years. My favorite dishes are full of butter and cheese and sour cream. In New York we had so many free luncheons with people on the magazine and various visiting celebrities I developed the habit of running my eye down those huge handwritten menus, where a tiny side dish of peas cost 50 or 60 cents, until I'd pick the richest, most expensive dishes and ordered a string of them. We were always taken out on expense accounts, so I never felt guilty. I made a point of eating so fast I never kept the other people waiting who generally ordered only chef's salad and grapefruit juice because they were trying to reduce. Almost everybody I met in New York was trying to reduce. I want to welcome the prettiest, smartest bunch of young ladies our staff has yet had the good luck to meet, the plump, bald master of ceremonies wheezed into his lapel microphone. This banquet is just a small sample of the hospitality our food testing kitchens here on Ladies Day would like to offer an appreciation for your visit. A delicate, ladle like spatter of applause, and we all sat at the enormous linen draped table. There were eleven of us girls from the magazine, together with most of our supervising editors, and the whole staff of the Ladies Day food testing kitchens in hygienic white smocks, neat hairnets, and flawless makeup of a uniform peach pie color. There were only eleven of us, because Doreen was missing. They had set her place next to mine for some reason, and the chair stayed empty. I saved her place card for her a pocket mirror with Doreen painted along the top of it in lacy script and a wreath of frosted daisies around the edge, framing the silver hole where her face would show. Doreen was spending the day with Lenny Shepard. She spent most of her free time with Lenny Shepard now. In the hour before our luncheon at Ladies' Day the big women's magazine that features lush double-page spreads of Technicolor meals, with a different theme and locale each month we had been shown around the endless glossy kitchens and seen how difficult it is to photograph apple pie a la mode under bright lights because the ice cream keeps melting and has to be propped up from behind with toothpicks and changed every time it starts looking too soppy. The sight of all the food stacked in those kitchens made me dizzy. It's not that we hadn't enough to eat at home, it's just that my grandmother always cooked economy joints and economy meat loafs and had the habit of saying, the minute you lifted the first forkful to your mouth, I hope you enjoy that. It cost 41 cents a pound, which always made me feel I was somehow eating pennies instead of Sunday roast. While we were standing up behind our chairs listening to the welcome speech, I had bowed my head and secretly eyed the position of the bowls of caviar. One bowl was set strategically between me and Doreen's empty chair. I figured the girl across from me couldn't reach it because of the mountainous centerpiece of marzipan fruit, and Betsy, on my right, would be too nice to ask me to share it with her if I just kept it out of the way at my elbow by my bread and butter plate. Besides, another bowl of caviar sat a little way to the right of the girl next to Betsy, and she could eat that. My grandfather and I had a standing joke. He was the head waiter at a country club near my hometown, and every Sunday my grandmother drove in to bring him home for his Monday off. My brother and I alternated going with her, and my grandfather always served Sunday supper to my grandmother and whichever of us was along as if we were regular club guests. He loved introducing me to special tidbits, and by the age of nine I had developed a passionate taste for cold vichyssoise and caviar and anchovy paste. The joke was that at my wedding my grandfather would see I had all the caviar I could eat. It was a joke because I never intended to get married, and even if I did, my grandfather couldn't have afforded enough caviar unless he robbed the country club kitchen and carried it off in a suitcase. Under cover of the clinking of water goblets and silverware and bone china, I paved my plate with chicken slices. Then I covered the chicken slices with caviar thickly as if I were spreading peanut butter on a piece of bread. Then I picked up the chicken slices in my fingers one by one, rolled them so the caviar wouldn't ooze off and ate them. I'd discovered, after a lot of extreme apprehension about what spoons to use, that if you do something incorrect at table with a certain arrogance, as if you knew perfectly well you were doing it properly, you can get away with it and nobody will think you are bad-mannered or poorly brought up they will think you are original and very witty. I learned this trick the day J.C. took me to lunch with a famous poet. 
He wore a horrible, lumpy, speckled brown tweed jacket and gray pants and a red and blue checked open-throated jersey in a very formal restaurant full of fountains and chandeliers, where all the other men were dressed in dark suits and immaculate white shirts. This poet ate his salad with his fingers, leaf by leaf, while talking to me about the antithesis of nature and art. I couldn't take my eyes off the pale, stubby white fingers traveling back and forth from the poet's salad bowl to the poet's mouth with one dripping lettuce leaf after another. Nobody giggled or whispered rude remarks. The poet made eating salad with your fingers seem to be the only natural and sensible thing to do. None of our magazine editors or the ladies' day staff members sat anywhere near me, and Betsy seemed sweet and friendly. She didn't even seem to like caviar, so I grew more and more confident. When I finished my first plate of cold chicken and caviar, I laid out another. Then I tackled the avocado and crab meat salad. Avocados are my favorite fruit. Every Sunday my grandfather used to bring me an avocado pear hidden at the bottom of his briefcase under six soiled shirts and the Sunday comics. He taught me how to eat avocados by melting grape jelly and French dressing together in a saucepan and filling the cup of the pear with the garnet sauce. I felt homesick for that sauce. The crab meat tasted bland in comparison. How was the fur show? I asked Betsy, when I was no longer worried about competition over my caviar. I scraped the last few salty black eggs from the dish with my soup spoon and licked it clean. It was wonderful. Betsy smiled. They showed us how to make an all-purpose neckerchief out of mink tails and a gold chain, the sort of chain you can get an exact copy of at Woolworth's for $1.98, and Hilda nipped down to the wholesale for warehouses right afterward and bought a bunch of mink tails at a big discount and dropped in at Woolworth's and then stitched the whole thing together coming up on the bus. I peered over at Hilda, who sat on the other side of Betsy. Sure enough, she was wearing an expensive-looking scarf of furry tails fastened on one side by a dangling gilt chain. I never really understood Hilda. She was six feet tall, with huge, slanted green eyes and thick red lips and a vacant, Slavic expression. She made hats. She was apprenticed to the fashion editor, which set her apart from the more literary ones among us like Doreen and Betsy and I myself, who all wrote columns even if some of them were only about health and beauty. I don't know if Hilda could read, but she made startling hats. She went to a special school for making hats in New York and every day she wore a new hat to work, constructed by her own hands out of bits of straw or fur or ribbon or veiling in subtle shades. That's amazing, I said. Amazing. I miss Doreen. She would have murmured some fine, scalding remark about Hilda's miraculous fur piece to cheer me up. I felt very low. I had been unmasked only that morning by J.C. herself, and I felt now that all the uncomfortable suspicions I had about myself were coming true, and I couldn't hide the truth much longer. After nineteen years of running after good marks and prizes and grants of one sort and another, I was letting up, slowing down, dropping clean out of the race. Why didn't you come along to the first show with us? Betsy asked. I had the impression she was repeating herself, and that she'd asked me the same question a minute ago, only I couldn't have been listening. Did you go off with Doreen? No, I said. I wanted to go to the first show, but JC called up and made me come into the office. That wasn't quite true about wanting to go to the show but I tried to convince myself now that it was true, so I could be really wounded about what J.C. had done. I told Betsy how I had been lying in bed that morning planning to go to the fur show. What I didn't tell her was that Doreen had come into my room earlier and said, What do you want to go to that assy show for? Lenny and I are going to Coney Island, so why don't you come along? Lenny can get you a nice fellow. The day shot to hell anyhow with that luncheon and then the film premiere in the afternoon, so nobody'll miss us. For a minute I was tempted. The show certainly did seem stupid. I have never cared for furs. What I decided to do in the end was lie in bed as long as I wanted to and then go to Central Park and spend the day lying in the grass, the longest grass I could find in that bald, duck pond wilderness. 
I told Doreen I would not go to the show or the luncheon or the film premiere, but that I would not go to Coney Island either, I would stay in bed. After Doreen left, I wondered why I couldn't go the whole way doing what I should anymore. This made me sad and tired. Then I wondered why I couldn't go the whole way doing what I shouldn't, the way Doreen did, and this made me even sadder and more tired. I didn't know what time it was, but I'd heard the girls bustling and calling in the hall and getting ready for the first show, and then I'd heard the hall go still, and as I lay on my back in bed staring up at the blank, white ceiling the stillness seemed to grow bigger and bigger until I felt my eardrums would burst with it. Then the phone rang. I stared at the phone for a minute. The receiver shook a bit in its bone-colored cradle, so I could tell it was really ringing. I thought I might have given my phone number to somebody at a dance or a party and then forgotten about it. I lifted the receiver and spoke in a husky, receptive voice. Hello? JC here, JC rapped out with brutal promptitude. I wondered if you happened to be planning to come into the office today. I sank down into the sheets. I couldn't understand why JC thought I'd be coming into the office. We had these mimeographed schedule cards so we could keep track of all our activities, and we spent a lot of mornings and afternoons away from the office going to affairs in town. Of course, some of the affairs were optional. There was quite a pause. Then I said meekly, I thought I was going to the first show. Of course I hadn't thought any such thing, but I couldn't figure out what else to say. I told her I thought I was going to the first show, I said to Betsy. But she told me to come into the office, she wanted to have a little talk with me, and there was some work to do. Oh, oh! Betsy said sympathetically. She must have seen the tears that plopped down into my dessert dish of meringue and brandy ice cream, because she pushed over her own untouched dessert and I started absently on that when I'd finished my own. I felt a bit awkward about the tears but they were real enough. J.C. had said some terrible things to me. When I made my wan entrance into the office at about ten o'clock, J.C. stood up and came round her desk to shut the door, and I sat in the swivel chair in front of my typewriter table facing her, and she sat in the swivel chair behind her desk facing me, with the window full of potted plants, shelf after shelf of them, springing up at her back like a tropical garden. Doesn't your work interest you, Esther? Oh, it does, it does, I said. It interests me very much. I felt like yelling the words, as if that might make them more convincing, but I controlled myself. All my life I'd told myself studying and reading and writing and working like mad was what I wanted to do, and it actually seemed to be true, I did everything well enough and got all A's, and by the time I made it to college nobody could stop me. I was college correspondent for the Town Gazette and editor of the Literary Magazine and Secretary of Honor Board, which deals with academic and social offenses and punishments of popular office and I had a well-known woman poet and professor on the faculty championing me for graduate school at the biggest universities in the East, and promises of full scholarships all the way, and now I was apprenticed to the best editor on an intellectual fashion magazine, and what did I do but balk and balk like a dull cart horse? I'm very interested in everything. The words fell with a hollow. Flatness on a J.C.'s desk, like so many wooden nickels. I'm glad of that, J.C. said a bit waspishly. You can learn a lot in this month on the magazine, you know, if you just roll up your shirt sleeves. The girl who was here before you didn't bother with any of the fashion show stuff. She went straight from this office on the time. My. I said, in the same sepulchral tone. That was quick. Of course, you have another year at college yet, J.C. went on a. Little more mildly. What do you have in mind after you graduate? What I always thought I had in mind was getting some big scholarship to graduate school or a grant to study all over Europe, and then I thought I'd be a professor and write books of poems or write books of poems and be an editor of some sort. Usually I had these plans on the tip of my tongue. I don't really know, I heard myself say. I felt a deep shock, hearing myself say that, because the minute I said it, I knew it was true. It sounded true, and I recognized it, the way you recognize some 
nondescript person that's been hanging around your door for ages and then suddenly comes up and introduces himself as your real father and looks exactly like you, so you know he really is your father, and the person you thought all your life was your father is a sham. I don't really know. You'll never get anywhere like that. JC paused. What languages do you have? Oh, I can read a bit of French, I guess, and I've always wanted to learn German. I'd been telling people I'd always wanted to learn German for about five years. My mother spoke German during her childhood in America and was stoned for it during the First World War by the children at school. My German-speaking father, dead since I was nine, came from some manic-depressive hamlet in the black heart of Prussia. My youngest brother was at that moment on the experiment in international living in Berlin and speaking German like a native. What I didn't say was that each time I picked up a German dictionary or a German book, the very sight of those dense, black, barbed wire letters made my mind shut like a clam. I've always thought I'd like to go into publishing. I tried to recover a thread that might lead me back to my old, bright salesmanship. I guess what I'll do is apply at some publishing house. You ought to read French and German, J.C. said mercilessly, and probably several other languages as well, Spanish and Italian better still, Russian, hundreds of girls flood into New York every June thinking they'll be editors. You need to offer something more than the run-of-the-mill person. You better learn some languages. I hadn't the heart to tell J.C. there wasn't one scrap of space on my senior year schedule to learn languages in. I was taking one of those honors programs that teach you to think independently, and except for a course in Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and a seminar in advanced poetry composition, I would spend my whole time writing on some obscure theme in the works of James Joyce. I hadn't picked out my theme yet, because I hadn't got round to reading. Finnegan's Wake, but my professor was very excited about my thesis and had promised to give me some leads on images about twins. I'll see what I can do. I told J.C. I probably might just fit in one of those double-barreled accelerated courses in elementary German they've rigged up. I thought at the time I might actually do this. I had a way of persuading my class dean to let me do irregular things. She regarded me as a sort of interesting experiment. At college I had to take a required course in physics and chemistry. I had already taken a course in botany and done very well. I never answered one test question wrong the whole year, and for a while I toyed with the idea of being a botanist and studying the wild grasses in Africa or the South American rainforests, because you can win big grants to study offbeat things like that in queer areas much more easily than winning grants to study art in Italy or English in England, there's not so much competition. Botany was fine because I loved cutting up leaves and putting them under the microscope and drawing diagrams of bread mold and the odd, heart-shaped leaf in the sex cycle of the fern, it seemed so real to me. The day I went into physics class it was death. A short dark man with a high lisping voice, named Mr. Manzi, stood in front of the class in a tight blue suit holding a little wooden ball. He put the ball on a steep grooved slide and let it run down to the bottom. Then he started talking about let equal acceleration and let t equal time and suddenly he was scribbling letters and numbers and equal signs all over the blackboard and my mind went dead. I took the physics book back to my dormitory. It was a huge book on porous mimeographed paper 400 pages long with no drawings or photographs, only diagrams and formulas between brick red cardboard covers. This book was written by Mr. Manzi to explain physics to college girls, and if it worked on us he would try to have it published. Well, I studied those formulas, I went to class and watched balls roll down slides and listened to bells ring and by the end of the semester most of the other girls had failed and I had a straight A. I heard Mr. Manzi saying to a bunch of the girls who were complaining that the course was too hard, No, it can't be too hard, because an edge will go to straight A. Who is it? Tell us, they said, but he shook his head and didn't say anything and gave me a sweet little conspiring smile. That's what gave me the idea of escaping the next semester of chemistry. I may have made a straight A in physics, but I was panic-struck. Physics made me sick the whole time I learned it. 
what I couldn't stand was this shrinking everything into letters and numbers. Instead of leaf shapes and enlarged diagrams of the holes the leaves breathe through and fascinating words like carotene and xanthophyll on the blackboard, there were these hideous, cramped, scorpion-lettered formulas in Mr. Manzi's special red chalk. I knew chemistry would be worse, because I'd seen a big chart of the 90-odd elements hung up in the chemistry lab, and all the perfectly good words like gold and silver and cobalt and aluminum were shortened to ugly abbreviations with different decimal numbers after them. If I had to strain my brain with any more of that stuff I would go mad. I would fail outright. It was only by a horrible effort of will that I had dragged myself through the first half of the year. So I went to my class dean with a clever plan. My plan was that I needed the time to take a course in Shakespeare, since I was, after all, an English major. She knew and I knew perfectly well I would get a straight A again in the chemistry course, so what was the point of my taking the exams? Why couldn't I just go to the classes and look on and take it all in and forget about marks or credits? It was a case of honor among honorable people, and the content meant more than the form, and marks were really a bit silly anyway, weren't they, when you knew you'd always get an A? My plan was strengthened by the fact that the college had just dropped the second year of required science for the classes after me anyway, so my class was the last to suffer under the old ruling. Mr. Manzi was in perfect agreement with my plan. I think it flattered him that I enjoyed his classes so much I take them for no materialistic reason like credit and an A, but for the sheer beauty of chemistry itself. I thought it was quite ingenious of me to suggest sitting in on the chemistry course even after I'd changed over to Shakespeare. It was quite an unnecessary gesture and made it seem I simply couldn't bear to give chemistry up. Of course. I would never have succeeded with this scheme if I hadn't made that A in the first place. And if my class dean had known how scared and depressed I was, and how I seriously contemplated desperate remedies such as getting a doctor's certificate that I was unfit to study chemistry, the formulas made me dizzy and so on, I'm sure she wouldn't have listened to me for a minute, but would have made me take the course regardless. As it happened, the faculty board passed my petition, and my class dean told me later that several of the professors were touched by it. They took it as a real step in intellectual maturity. I had to laugh when I thought about the rest of that year. I went to the chemistry class five times a week and didn't miss a single one. Mr. Manzi stood at the bottom of the big, rickety old amphitheater making blue flames and red flares and clouds of yellow stuff by pouring the contents of one test tube into another, and I shut his voice out of my ears by pretending it was only a mosquito in the distance and sat back enjoying the bright lights and the colored fires and wrote page after page of villanelles and sonnets. Mr. Manzi would glance at me now and then and see me writing, and send up a sweet little appreciative smile. I guess he thought I was writing down all those formulas not for exam time, like the other girls, but because his presentation fascinated me so much I couldn't help it. 4. I don't know just why my successful evasion of chemistry should have floated into my mind there in J.C.'s office. All the time she talked to me, I saw Mr. Manzi standing on thin air in back of J.C.'s head, like something conjured up out of a hat holding his little wooden ball and the test tube that billowed a great cloud of yellow smoke the day before Easter vacation and smelt of rotten eggs and made all the girls and Mr. Manzi laugh. I felt sorry for Mr. Manzi. I felt like going down to him on my hands and knees and apologizing for being such an awful liar. J.C. handed me a pile of story manuscripts and spoke to me much more kindly. I spent the rest of the morning reading the stories and typing out what I thought of them on the pink in her office memo sheets and sending them into the office of Betsy's editor to be read by Betsy the next day. J.C. interrupted me now and then to tell me something practical or a bit of gossip. J.C. was going to lunch that noon with two famous writers, a man and a lady. The man had just sold six short stories to the New Yorker and six to J.C. This surprised me as I didn't know magazines bought stories in lots of six, and I was staggered by the thought of the amount of money six stories would probably bring in. J.C. said she had to be very careful at this lunch, because the lady writer wrote stories too, 
but she had never had any in the New Yorker and J.C. had only taken one from her in five years. J.C. had to flatter the more famous man at the same time as she was careful not to hurt the less famous lady. When the cherubs in J.C.'s French wall clock waved their wings up and down and put their little gilt trumpets to their lips and pinged out twelve notes one after the other, J.C. told me I'd done enough work for the day, and to go off to the ladies' day tour and banquet and to the film premiere, and she would see me bright and early tomorrow. Then she slipped a suit jacket over her lilac blouse, pin a hat of imitation lilacs on the top of her head powdered her nose briefly and adjusted her thick spectacles. She looked terrible, but very wise. As she left the office, she patted my shoulder with one lilac-gloved hand. Don't let the wicked city get you down. I sat quietly in my swivel chair for a few minutes and thought about J.C. I tried to imagine what it would be like if I were E.E.G., the famous editor, in an office full of potted rubber plants and African violets my secretary had to water each morning. I wished I had a mother like J.C. Then I'd know what to do. My own mother wasn't much help. My mother had taught shorthand and typing to support us ever since my father died, and secretly she hated it and hated him for dying and leaving no money because he didn't trust life insurance salesmen. She was always on to me to learn shorthand after college, so I'd have a practical skill as well as a college degree. Even the apostles were tent makers, she'd say. They had to live, just the way we do. I dabbled my fingers in the bowl of warm water a ladies' day waitress set down in place of my two empty ice cream dishes. Then I wiped each finger carefully with my linen napkin which was still quite clean. Then I folded the linen napkin and laid it between my lips and brought my lips down on it precisely. When I put the napkin back on the table a fuzzy pink lip shape bloomed right in the middle of it like a tiny heart. I thought what a long way I had come. The first time I saw a finger bowl was at the home of my benefactress. It was the custom at my college, the little freckled lady in the scholarship's office told me, to write to the person whose scholarship you had, if they were still alive and thank them for it. I had the scholarship of Philomena Guinea, a wealthy novelist who went to my college in the early 1900s and had her first novel made into a silent film with Betty Davis as well as a radio serial that was still running, and it turned out she was alive and lived in a large mansion not far from my grandfather's country club. So I wrote Philomena Guinea a long letter in coal black ink on gray paper with the name of the college embossed on it in red. I wrote what the leaves looked like in autumn when I bicycled out into the hills, and how wonderful it was to live on a campus instead of commuting by bus to a city college and having to live at home, and how all knowledge was opening up before me and perhaps one day I would be able to write great books the way she did. I had read one of Mrs. Guinea's books in the town library the college library didn't stock them for some reason and it was crammed from beginning to end with long, suspenseful questions, would Evelyn discern that Gladys? Knew Roger in her past. Wondered Hector feverishly and how could Donald marry her when he learned of the child Elsie, hidden away with Mrs. Rollmop on the secluded country farm? Griselda demanded of her bleak, moonlit pillow. These books earned Philomena Guinea, who later told me she had been very stupid at college, millions and millions of dollars. Mrs. Guinea answered my letter and invited me to lunch at her home. That was where I saw my first finger bowl. The water had a few cherry blossoms floating in it, and I thought it must be some clear sort of Japanese after-dinner soup and ate every bit of it, including the crisp little blossoms. Mrs. Guinea never said anything, and it was only much later, when I told a debutante I knew at college about the dinner, that I learned what I had done. When we came out of the sunnily lit interior of the ladies' day offices, the streets were gray and fuming with rain. It wasn't the nice kind of rain that rinses you clean but the sort of rain I imagine they must have in Brazil. It flew straight down from the sky in drops the size of coffee saucers and hit the hot sidewalks with a hiss that sent clouds of steam writhing up from the gleaming, dark concrete. My secret hope of spending the afternoon alone in Central Park died in the glass eggbeater of Ladies' Day's revolving doors. I found myself spewed out through the warm rain and into the dim, throbbing cave of a cab, 
together with Betsy and Hilda and Emily and Offenbach, a prim little girl with a bun of red hair and a husband and three children in Teaneck, New Jersey. The movie was very poor. It starred a nice blonde girl who looked like June Allison but was really somebody else, and a sexy black-haired girl who looked like Elizabeth Taylor but was also somebody else, and two big, broad-shouldered boneheads with names like Rick and Gil. It was a football romance and it was in Technicolor. I hate Technicolor. Everybody in a Technicolor movie seems to feel obliged to wear a lurid costume in each new scene and to stand around like a clothes horse with a lot of very green trees or very yellow wheat or very blue ocean rolling away for miles and miles in every direction. Most of the action in this picture took place in the football stands, with the two girls waving and cheering in smart suits with orange chrysanthemums the size of cabbages on their lapels, or in a ballroom, where the girls swooped across the floor with their dates, in dresses like something out of Gone with the Wind, and then sneaked off into the powder room to say nasty intense things to each other. Finally, I could see the nice girl was going to end up with the nice football hero and the sexy girl was going to end up with nobody, because the man named Gil had only wanted a mistress and not a wife all along and was now packing off to Europe on a single ticket. At about this point I began to feel peculiar. I looked round me at all the rows of wrapped little heads with the same silver glow on them at the front and the same black shadow on them at the back, and they looked like nothing more or less than a lot of stupid moon brains. I felt in terrible danger of puking. I didn't know whether it was the awful movie giving me a stomachache or all that caviar I had eaten. I'm going back to the hotel, I whispered to Betsy through the half dark. Betsy was staring at the screen with deadly concentration. Don't you feel good? she whispered, barely moving her lips. No, I said. I feel like hell. So do I, I'll come back with you. We slipped out of our seats and said excuse me excuse me excuse me down. The length of our row, while the people grumbled and hissed and shifted their rain boots and umbrellas to let us pass and I stepped on as many feet as I could because it took my mind off this enormous desire to puke that was ballooning up in front of me so fast I couldn't see round it. The remains of a tepid rain were still sifting down when we stepped out into the street. Betsy looked a fright. The bloom was gone from her cheeks and her drained face floated in front of me, green and sweating. We fell into one of those yellow checkered cabs that are always waiting at the curb when you are trying to decide whether or not you want a taxi, and by the time we reached the hotel I had puked once and Betsy had puked twice. The cab driver took the corners with such momentum that were thrown together first on one side of the back seat and then on the other. Each time one of us felt sick, she would lean over quietly as if she had dropped something and was picking it up off the floor and the other one would hum a little and pretend to be looking out the window. The cab driver seemed to know what we were doing, even so. Hey, he protested, driving through a light that had just turned red, you can't do that in my cab, you better get out and do it in the street. But we didn't say anything, and I guess he figured we were almost at the hotel so he didn't make us get out until we pulled up in front of the main entrance. We didn't dare wait to add up the fare. We stuffed a pile of silver into the cabbie's hand and dropped a couple of Kleenexes to cover the mess on the floor, and ran in through the lobby and onto the empty elevator. Luckily for us, it was a quiet time of day. Betsy was sick again in the elevator. And I held her head, and then I was sick and she held mine. Usually after a good puke you feel better right away. We hugged each other and then said goodbye and went off to opposite ends of the hall to lie down in our own rooms. There is nothing like puking with somebody to make. You into old friends. But the minute I'd shut the door behind me and undressed and dragged myself onto the bed, I felt worse than ever. I felt I just had to go to the toilet. I struggled into my white bathrobe with the blue cornflowers on it and staggered down to the bathroom. Betsy was already there. I could hear her groaning behind the door, so I hurried on around the corner to the bathroom in the next wing. I thought I would die, it was so far. I sat on the toilet and leaned my head over the edge of the washbowl and I thought I was losing my guts and my dinner both. 
the sickness rolled through me in great waves. After each wave it would fade away and leave me limp as a wet leaf and shivering all over and then I would feel it rising up in me again, and the glittering white torture chamber tiles under my feet and over my head and on all four sides closed in and squeezed me to pieces. I don't know how long I kept at it. I let the cold water and the bowl go on running loudly with the stopper out, so anybody who came by would think I was washing my clothes and then when I felt reasonably safe I stretched out on the floor and lay quite still. It didn't seem to be summer anymore. I could feel the winter shaking my bones and banging my teeth together, and the big white hotel towel I had dragged down with me lay under my head numb as a snowdrift. I thought it very bad manners for anyone to pound on a bathroom door the way some person was pounding. They could just go around the corner and find another bathroom the way I had done and leave me in peace. But the person kept banging and pleading with me to let them in and I thought I dimly recognized the voice. It sounded a bit like Emily and Offenbach. Just a minute, I said then. My words bundled out thick as molasses. I pulled myself together and slowly rose and flushed the toilet for the tenth time and sopped the bowl clean and rolled up the towel so the vomit stains didn't show very clearly and unlocked the door and stepped out into the hall. I knew it would be fatal if I looked at Emily and or anybody else so I fixed my eyes glassily on a window that swam at the end of the hall and put one foot in front of the other. The next thing I had a view of was somebody's shoe. It was a stout shoe of cracked black leather and quite old, with tiny air holes and a scalloped pattern over the toe and a dull polish, and it was pointed at me. It seemed to be placed on a hard green surface that was hurting my right cheekbone. I kept very still, waiting for a clue that would give me some notion of what to do. A little to the left of the shoe I saw a vague heap of blue cornflowers on a white ground and this made me want to cry. It was the sleeve of my own bathrobe I was looking at, and my left hand lay pale as a cod at the end of it. She's all right now. The voice came from a cool, rational region far above my head. For a minute I didn't think there was anything strange about it and then I thought it was strange. It was a man's voice, and no men were allowed to be in our hotel at any time of the night or day. How many others are there? The voice went on. I listened with interest. The floor seemed wonderfully solid. It was comforting to know I had fallen and could fall no farther. Eleven, I think, a woman's voice answered. I figured she must belong to the black shoe. I think there's eleven more of um, but one's missing so there's only ten. Well, you get this one to bed and I'll take care of the rest. I heard a hollow bump bump in my right ear that grew fainter and fainter. Then a door opened in the distance and there were voices and groans, and the door shut again. Two hands slid under my armpits and the woman's voice said, Come, come, lovey, we'll make it yet, and I felt myself being half-lifted and slowly the doors began to move by, one by one, until we came to an open door and went in. The sheet on my bed was folded back, and the woman helped me lie down and covered me up to the chin and rested for a minute in the bedside armchair, fanning herself with one plump, pink hand. She wore gilt-rimmed spectacles and a white nurse's cap. Who are you? I asked in a fault voice. I'm the hotel nurse. What's the matter with me? Poisoned, she said briefly. Poisoned, the whole lot of you. I never. Seen anything like it. Sick here, sick there, whatever have you young ladies been stuffing yourselves with? Is everybody else sick too? I asked with some hope. The whole of your lot, she affirmed with relish. Sick as dogs and crying for ma. The room hovered around me with great gentleness, as if the chairs and the tables and the walls were withholding their weight out of sympathy for my sudden frailty. The doctor's given you an injection, the nurse said from the doorway. You'll sleep now. And the door took her place like a sheet of blank paper, and then a larger sheet of paper took the place of the door, and I drifted toward it and smiled myself to sleep. Somebody was standing by my pillow with a white cup. Drink this, they said. I shook my head. The pillow crackled like a wad of straw. Drink this and you'll feel better. 
a thick white china cup was lowered under my nose. In the wan light. That might have been evening and might have been dawn I contemplated the clean amber liquid. Pads of butter floated on the surface and a faint chickeny aroma fumed up to my nostrils. My eyes moved tentatively to the skirt behind the cup. Betsy, I said. Betsy nothing, it's me. I raised my eyes then, and saw Doreen's head silhouetted against the paling window, her blonde hair lit at the tips from behind like a halo of gold. Her face was in shadow, so I couldn't make out her expression, but I felt a sort of expert tenderness flowing from the ends of her fingers. She might have been Betsy or my mother or a fern-scented nurse. I bent my head and took a sip of the broth. I thought my mouth must be made of sand. I took another sip and then another and another until the cup was empty. I felt purged and holy and ready for a new life. Doreen set the cup on the windowsill and lowered herself into the armchair. I noticed that she made no move to take out a cigarette, and as she was a chain smoker this surprised me. Well, you almost died, she said finally. I guess it was all that caviar. Caviar nothing. It was the crab meat. They did tests on it and it was. Chock full of tomaine. I had a vision of the celestially white kitchens of Ladies' Day. Stretching into infinity. I saw avocado pear after avocado pear being stuffed with crab meat and mayonnaise and photographed under brilliant lights. I saw the delicate, pink mottled claw meat poking seductively through its blanket of mayonnaise and the bland yellow pear cup with its rim of alligator green cradling the whole mess. Poison. Who did tests? I thought the doctor might have pumped somebody's stomach and then analyzed what he found in his hotel laboratory. Those dodos on Ladies' Day. As soon as you all started keeling over like ninepins somebody called into the office and the office called across to Ladies' Day and they did tests on everything left over from the big lunch. Ha! Ha! I echoed hollowly. It was good to have Doreen back. They sent presents, she added. They're in a big cart now in the hall. How did they get here so fast? Special express delivery, what do you think? They can't afford to have the lot of you running around saying you got poison at ladies' day. You could sue them for every penny they own if you just knew some smart lawman. What are the presents? I began to feel if it was a good enough present I wouldn't mind about what happened, because I felt so pure as a result. Nobody's opened the box yet, they're all out flat. I'm supposed to be carting soup into everybody, seeing as I'm the only one on my feet, but. I brought you yours first. See what the present is, I begged. Then I remembered and said, I've. A present for you as well. Doreen went out into the hall. I could hear her rustling around for. A minute and then the sound of paper tearing. Finally she came back carrying a thick book with a glossy cover and people's names printed all over it. The 30 Best Short Stories of the Year. She dropped the book in my lap. There's 11 more of them out there in that box. I suppose they thought it'd give you something to read while you were sick. She paused. Where's mine? I fished in my pocketbook and handed Doreen the mirror with her name. And the daisies on it. Doreen looked at me and I looked at her and we both burst out laughing. You can have my soup if you want, she said. They put twelve soups on the tray by mistake in Lenny and I stuffed down so many hot dogs while we were waiting for the rain to stop I couldn't eat another mouthful. Bring it in, I said. I'm starving. Five. At seven the next morning the telephone rang. Slowly I swam up from the bottom of a black sleep. I already had a telegram from J.C. stuck in my mirror, telling me not to bother to come into work but to rest for a day and get completely well, and how sorry she was about the bad crab meat, so I couldn't imagine who would be calling. I reached out and hitched the receiver onto my pillow so the mouthpiece rested on my collarbone and the earpiece lay on my shoulder. Hello? A man's voice said, Is that Miss Esther Greenwood? I thought I detected a slight foreign accent. It certainly is, I said. 
this is Constantine something or other. I couldn't make out the last name, but it was full of S's and K's. I didn't know any Constantine, but I hadn't the heart to say so. Then I remembered Mrs. Willard and her simultaneous interpreter. Of course, of course. I cried, sitting up and clutching the phone. To me with both hands. I'd never have given Mrs. Willard credit for introducing me to a man. Named Constantine. I collected men with interesting names. I already knew a Socrates. He was tall and ugly and intellectual and the son of some big Greek movie producer in Hollywood, but also a Catholic, which ruined it for both of us. In addition to Socrates, I knew a white Russian named Attila at the Boston School of Business Administration. Gradually I realized that Constantine was trying to arrange a meeting for us later in the day. Would you like to see the UN this afternoon? I can already see the UN, I told him, with a little hysterical giggle. He seemed nonplussed. I can see it from my window. I thought perhaps my English was a touch. Too fast for him. There was a silence. Then he said, maybe you would like a bite to eat afterward. I detected the vocabulary of Mrs. Willard and my heart sank. Mrs. Willard always invited you for a bite to eat. I remember that this man had been a guest at Mrs. Willard's house when he first came to America. Mrs. Willard had one of these arrangements where you open your house to foreigners and then when you go abroad they open their houses to you. I now saw quite clearly that Mrs. Willard had simply traded her open house in Russia for my bite to eat in New York. Yes, I would like a bite to eat, I said stiffly. What time will you come? I'll call for you in my car about two. It's the Amazon, isn't it? Yes. Ah, I know where that is. For a moment I thought his tone was laden with special meaning, and... Then I figured that probably some of the girls at the Amazon were secretaries at the UN and maybe he had taken one of them out at one time. I let him hang up first, and then I hung up and lay back in the pillows, feeling grim. There I went again building up a glamorous picture of a man who would love me passionately the minute he met me, and all out of a few prosy nothings. A duty tour of the UN and a post-UN sandwich. I tried to jack up my morale. Probably Mrs. Willard's simultaneous interpreter would be short and ugly and I would come to look down on him in the end the way I looked down on Buddy Willard. This thought gave me a certain satisfaction. Because I did look down on Buddy Willard and although everybody still thought I would marry him when he came out of the TB place, I knew I would never marry him if he were the last man on earth. Buddy Willard was a hypocrite. Of course, I didn't know he was a hypocrite at first. I thought he was the most wonderful boy I'd ever seen. I'd adored him from a distance for five years before he even looked at me, and then there was a beautiful time when I still adored him and he started looking at me. And then just as he was looking at me more and more I discovered quite by accident what an awful hypocrite he was, and now he wanted me to marry him and I hated his guts. The worst part of it was I couldn't come straight out and tell him what I thought of him, because he caught TB before I could do that, and now I had to humor him along till he got well again and could take the unvarnished truth. I decided not to go down to the cafeteria for breakfast. It would only mean getting dressed, and what was the point of getting dressed if you were staying in bed for the morning? I could have called down and asked for a breakfast tray in my room, I guess, but then I would have to tip the person who brought it up and I never knew how much to tip. I'd had some very upsetting experiences trying to tip people in New York. When I first arrived at the Amazon a dwarfish, bald man in a bellhop's uniform carried my suitcase up in the elevator and unlocked my room for me. Of course I rushed immediately to the window and looked out to see what the view was. After a while I was aware of this bellhop turning on the hot and cold taps in the washbowl and saying this is the hot and this is the cold and switching on the radio and telling me all the names of all the New York 